Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Bobby Rush. Thank you, sir. Got you situated here. Hello, hello, hello. All right, man. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here, buddy. Now, you, uh, you came down last night. Yeah, I came down last night, uh, hung out with my good friend, put a guy and all the guys in the band and all the people who made up the, the audience, so we had a good time. Absolutely, man. That was, uh, that was wild. Y'all seemed to be really enjoying yourself. Well, I enjoyed it because of uh, we old friends, but I enjoyed everything but the weather because I live in Jackson, Mississippi now. <laughs> when I left home, it was, it was about 75 degrees. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, I was going to ask, so you and Buddy actually both came up from Louisiana. Yeah, our, I was born in a little place called Homer, Louisiana. But I left in 1947. Went to Pine Bluff, Arkansas with my father, who was a preacher, pastor of a church, minister. In 1951, I moved to Chicago. I lived right here for 48 years. Then I got tired of the snow and I moved back to Mississippi, moved to Mississippi, rather. But I believe Buddy Guy moved in 1957. Mm -hmm. I believe I met Buddy like 55 or 56, a little before he came to Chicago for a hot minute with the, the Niels brothers. And uh, he came in 57. I believe Elder James came in 57. Uh, little Walter and myself, Muddy Waters, Willie Dixon, Bo Diddley, uh, was all here. And they all was recording that chess recording company, right. along with Pick Me, Mark, and Mom Mabel. But I believe now out of that mold, uh, probably Chuck Berry and I is the oldest one of that mold and the last one left, and then Buddy Guy. Yeah. You know? And uh, we, we've we been friends for, for many, many years, about 60 years, I guess. <laughs> and uh, he is the oldest. All right. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I I think I, I have a little little age on it, but not much. But anyway, <clears throat> when you get over 80 years old, it doesn't make a difference anyway. Okay. Yeah. Now, do you remember where you first met him? You see? I believe it was in Banton Rouge uh, in Port Allen, across the river from Banton Rouge, in a place called Pie Main, a little, little joint over there we met. Over there. I went to see him over there myself and a little guy. Uh, Went to see him one night, uh, Little Milton, uh, rest his heart, and went to see Buddy. <clears throat> and then uh, I didn't meet Buddy anymore until a couple of years later. I saw him at another place. I can't remember what it place. Then in 1957, there was a guy called Curly. Curly was a place on Madison Street in Homan. It had a place called Curly's Lounge. So Curly said, I got this guy, Buddy, guy coming up. Gonna play for my place. What you think about it? I said, Oh, that little old skinny guy can play. <laughs> and I've, uh, he went to play for the guy for about two or three weeks, and Buddy kicked a hole in the wall. <laughs> and he called me, said, Buddy, he said, Bobby Rose, you got to come get this guy. He done kicked a hole in my wall. But what Buddy was doing, he was playing, and he was kicking feet in the wall until he knocked a hole in the wall. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. And, and that's when that's when we come real tight because he knew the guy that. I knew the guy well that he was working for. Sure. And then we come to be friends, and he went his way, and I went my way doing what we have to do with Chess Recording Company. He's played with many guys. But I can tell you that uh, he's one of the few guys who came from nothing to make something out of himself. Because if he liked me, he probably can tell you the story better than I can tell you, but we weren't always making money, man. Mm. It was about the love of the music. Sure. You know, same way with me. He, he, I don't know his first guitar, but my first guitar was an old guitar I made out of one string on the wall. I put a brick at the top and a ball at the uh, bottom of it. Until one day the brick fell out and hit me in the head. <laughs> Started me to bleed, and then I was smart enough to put the brick at the bottom and All the right. ball at the top. <laughs> then I come over to this one sound. You know, that old, 
And that's what that, I got that sound. And so I, so I was playing harmonica and the guitar and all that time. So finally, my daddy uh, had a brother, he's my uncle. He had a uh, brother, his name was Son Scott. He gave me a guitar. I was about seven, eight years old. He said, uh, I got a guitar. I may give it to you, boy. He was about 15 years old, older than I. And I noticed he liked the little girls. So when the girl was coming around, I would tell him, I call him son. I said, son, there's a girl over there. He said, wow. He would go take talk to the girl. And while he was talking to the girl, he let me have his guitar. <laughs> and other than that, he wouldn't let me play it. So I went over and played the guitar. Finally, he gave me the guitar. And I brought it home, my daddy being a preacher, I hid it in the loft, it was in the country, hid it in the loft where the sun got to it, it whopped the neck up. And I would take it every couple of days and put it in the horse trough where they, we were getting water to the cows and the mules and the horses. And I would put it in this water and the old neck would straighten back out. I said, wow. And I would string it up and had those, those dead strings on it. But it sounded pretty good to me. So finally, my daddy told me, he said, hey, boy. I said, yes, sir. He said, bring me that guitar. Let me play it for you. I didn't know he knew I had a guitar. <laughs> and he said, let me play a guitar for you, boy. I used to play a little song for a little lady when I was a little older than you. Well, I wanted to hear that. I got real close to him because I know he's going to talk about my mama. I thought. I either going to sing, you know, yeah. glory, glory, hallelujah, yeah. when I laid my burden down, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But no, he said, <clears throat> let me sing this song. In the back of our house, there was a tree, pecan tree, and another tree we call it chanky pen. Little bitty thing, looked like a little pecan. And uh, he said, let me sing this song. He started to sing. He tuned the guitar up. I said, wow, my daddy tuned the guitar up. I'm going to hear me some gospel. I hear about my mama now. He said, me, my gal, with the chanky pin hunting, she fell down, and I saw something. I said, daddy. <laughs> I said, sing it again. <laughs> now, in my little mind, I wanted my daddy to sing the song. What I wanted him to do is sing the other verse. Now, I already know she fell down. <laughs> I want to know now the next verse you tell me what he saw. Yeah. I said, sing it again, Daddy. My mama's in the kitchen cooking. He said, me and my dad was the chicken pen hunting. My mama said, eh. <laughs> me don't sing that kind of song to that boy. But I got real close to my dad. I said, sing it again, Daddy. He said, me and my dad was the chicken pen hunting. She fell down, and I saw something. I said, Daddy. I didn't want my mama to hear me. I said, how big was she? Oh, she's old, boy. She was fat, big old fat girl. Weighed about 350 pounds. <laughs> 350 pounds. I said, what's your hat on? He said, nothing but a dress, boy. Nothing but a dress. In my mind, big fat lady falling down. Nothing on but a dress. Wow. Now I can just see it right now. You know, just see that. You know. <laughs> That's something to see, you know. I said, sing it again. So by that time, my mama said, <clears throat> oh, he didn't pay my mama. Okay? He had his hat on, just come out the cotton field with his overalls on, been picking cotton all day. He said, me and my guy want to check it in, hon. My mom was coming. I said, Dad, 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 here come Mama, here come Mama. He didn't see her, didn't care one word. I don't know where he saw her, didn't care. <laughs> he said, me and my guy went to check me in, honey. She fell down, and I kept running. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the song would have been. My mother busted up. I don't know. You know? So that was my All first right. thing to get into the business of the, of the music. And All my right, daddy man. Was so, my, so it was in your family. Oh, God, man. My daddy was the biggest inspiration to me. Because he never told me to sing the blues as a preacher, but he never told me not to sing the blues. All right. So here I am. I'm a blues All man. right. Indeed. Indeed. Now, I, uh, I was going to ask, so you also, you got an early start. You had a band pretty early on there with uh, Elmore James. Is that right? Yeah, man, Elmore James. That's, huh. You don't want to know a story about that. No? Oh, yeah. You do. Yeah. I was about. 18, 19 years old, Elmo James. Not that much older, you know. I'm, I'd get you the age in a minute. But I needed a, a guitar player. I had Boyd Gilmo, who was Elmo James' first cousin. He told me that he taught Elmo James how to play a slide. And he was a good slide player. Boyd Gilmo, I'm talking about. But I needed Elmo James because the guy wanted to pay Elmo James 
$5 a night, and I had three days of $15. Emo Jane wanted $2,500, $25, not $2,500, $25. I said, Emo Jane, I can't pay it. All I can give you is $5 a night, $5 a night. And it's in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, a place called Jack Rabbit. He said, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I got to have $25. Got $25 for the whole weekend now. I say, I say, Elmo, I just need you so bad. By that time, that the, a gentleman was with me. He had a funeral home. He was dating a lady who was going with the lady who's on a funeral home, Delta Funeral Home. She had one in Belzoni and one in Clarksdale. So this lady was about 22, 23 years old, good-looking lady. She came by me. She was engaged with my best friend, who was Lee Robertson. And Robert Zine, I knew her and both of them very well. And I was sitting there talking to Elbow J. So, wow, who is that pretty lady there? I'd do anything just to talk to her. I walked away. I said, what you, what you say? <laughs> <laughs> That's my friend lady. Yeah. This is this bad story. Uh. <laughs> and I said, do anything. I said, uh, maybe I can get you, to, if I can get y'all hooked up, will you play for me? He said, I'll play free if you get me hooked up. So this guy had this limousine, and he had them hearse. So I would get him to take me to my gigs in the hearse, but I would let him stop two blocks from the club because I didn't want nobody to see me getting out this hearse. You know, we got the amplifiers in the hearse, and brand new car, Cadillac. <laughs> but I didn't want nobody to see me getting out this hearse, you know, thinking I was already gone. You know? <laughs> so we did that for a few weekends. So finally, Elmo said, when you going to introduce me to this girl? I introduced him. So every other week, M.O. Joe, M.O. Jane would go play for me free and stay at this guy's house. And I, hey, I don't know what they did. I, I think they probably went chinky pin hunting or something. Okay, know? yeah, you yeah, know? no doubt. I don't know what they did, but I, I went in there. I just hooked it up. You know? Sure, sure. That's a bad story. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know hey, man, you need the band. You know, that's, uh, I, I, I got my band. I got you got it, your I, band. And I got it free yeah. every, other, every other week. That's every right, other week. man. That's right. Um, now I'm curious. Uh, I guess for people who don't know, like you're not just known as uh, as a guitar player, and a harmonica player, and a songwriter, but uh, as like kind of um, just a really high energy entertainer, you know, and uh, just a real showman, you know. Um, well, well, this 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 is a show business. It's not a singing business, not a guitar business, not an amplifier business, not whatever. It's show business, and this is what I do. I know where you're coming from because I have the, uh, my show is like a Las Vegas road show. It's mm -hmm. like a, and that's the kind of show, it's a show, you know, it's, that's what it is. Absolutely. You know? Well, I was curious, I guess, were you always like that? Yes. Or is that something that you kind of picked up along the way? Or? No, I was always like that. I just couldn't display it because of an early of my age, I, when you're talking about three or four pieces in the band, yeah. you couldn't hardly pay them. Right. Then you got to add the, the girls, dancers, and the, and the other instruments, and the horns. Now you're talking about seven or eight people, sometimes yeah. ten people. You couldn't afford it, man. Sure. You couldn't afford it. So I had to find a way to uh, downside that to a couple of girls on the side of them, but still have this this raunchy energy kind of thing going. And I kind of developed that. And I, I thought about my song that I write, too. I write my song in the direction that I want my show to go. Yeah. I talk about... Uh, talk about the big fat ladies, the little ladies, skinny ladies. Yeah. I talk about them all, but but everybody know what I like. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you start incorporating uh, the girls into your act? I started in 1963, really, but I kind of let it go. But I had it, I, I had it, a snake dancers. But I had the nice looking ladies had snakes dancers, but nobody wouldn't, didn't nobody see the snakes really. They were watching their bodies. All right, you know. So that was the way I said snake dancing, nice shake dancing, snake dancing. So snake was crawling everywhere, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah all down the, you know, yeah. That but, didn't get you kicked out of any clubs? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of why I was coming. I mean, I, tr I try to do everything on a happy medium kind of thing. I'm kind of joyful kind of mm -hmm. in, in life, you know. Let, let me tell you that. I've been recording this year for 60 some odd years. I have 374 records. It's a lot of records. A lot of records. And up, down, good, bad. And I've been here, done this, and 
God, I played many places and uh, had some joyful time. I had some sad time, but the good overtake the bad. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I don't have no chips on my shoulder about what happened to me in my life, where I went and what I did and what I done, who I did it with. Sure. That may be some things, if I had to do it over, I wouldn't do it quite like that. Mm -hmm. But I did it the best way I knew I could do it at the time I did it. Yeah. Um, so. I'm curious, actually. Um, you mentioned all those records. Are, are most of those studio albums, or is a lot of that, is that a lot of live recording? Or uh, well, a I lot did, of records. I did probably about 18 or 20 records live. Mm -hmm. You know, just not all CDs, but just because right. when I started, you had the seven to eight, just the right. 33 and the third, just 45 and the whole bit. Yeah. Um, and I did a lot of records. I did a lot of independent stuff, and and I recorded with a lot of big record companies also, just like I have a, a brand-new CD now on Rounders Record called Porcupine Meat. Yeah, Porcupine you know Meat. It. Yeah, you know what? I want to come back to that, actually, because you're, you're up for a Grammy, and that's a whole other, yes. uh, again. Grammy, how about it for one time for Mr. Bobby Rush? Nominated for a Grammy. Keep your eyes on that this year, Porcupine Meat. Well, this is my fourth time up for Grammy, but I believe I've been in the run of the nominated for a blues artist. I believe it's 27 times. I believe I won 18 out of 27. Now I'm up. Now I'm up for a, a Grammy. We just hope to bring it home. Absolutely, man. We just uh, hope to bring it. Even if I don't bring it home, I'm a winner because I'm in the race. Absolutely, man. That's uh, that's already a rare rare honor. Yes. Um, yeah. So actually, you know, let's talk about Porcupine Me for a minute. All right. Now I, I saw you said uh, it ain't too fat, ain't too lean. Is that or too, too lean to? Well, let me see. Oh, yeah, you, well, you, 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 you don't really think about it. You I don't, yeah, you know. You, you're not a country boy. That's true. I've never eaten porcupine. I, no, I, no, I haven't either, be honest. <laughs> I was but what I was talking, that. What I was talking about, it was an example. I'm in love with this woman that I know she don't mean me no good. I would leave her if I could. Mm -hmm. Like I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. Sure. Now, that's called porcupine meat, too fat to eat and too lean to throw away. <laughs> I'm go. afraid if she leave me, she may come to you. Yeah. Then you be getting what I know is good, but I can't stand it because she do the things for me and other people too, you know. Yeah. In my mind. Sure, sure, yeah. man. Now, uh, I was going to ask you, you, you tour, you play a lot. You've been, you know, <laughs> a hard working man. Um, I played less show this year than I played in probably 50 years, but beyond that, I don't think I played under 200 shows a year for the last 55 years. All right. So that's a grueling and intense schedule. That's uh, murdering. <laughs> yeah. Now, but it's also like getting into the studio and cutting records is also its own kind of time-consuming process. And a lot of blues musicians will sometimes go, you know, for years or even decades without putting out albums. And you've been cranking them out. Uh, is there something about getting into the studio or, or making these records, what drives you to keep recording in addition to, you know, your heavy performance schedule? I think because of my background where I came up as a, uh, and I'm not a religion, but I am a biblical study, and the Bible is something that I use for a roadmap to my life mm -hmm. from where I should or should not do. But I think what keeps me enthused because what it could have been. You know, I think about where I am. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm clo so closer than who I was, I'm so thankful for who I am because I know that a man, a woman, can live a long time without water or food, but you can't live long without hope. Mm -hmm. I'm still enthused about the music and the things that I do because uh, someone told me after I was in the business for 25 years, it could have been better. I said, Barbara Rich, you're going to be a superstar when you're going to make a lot of money doing this. Well, that would sound good, but I'm going to make a lot of money do what I would do free because I didn't do this in the beginning for the money. I did it for the love of the music. Mm -hmm. And it turned into the money thing. Sure. You know, but I do it for the love of the music, you know, because I, uh, uh, as a blues man, I'm a blessed man to be able to cross over and never crossed out. Hmm. I'm, bl I'm blessed. Right on, I'm man. a blessed man. I just thank God for it every day that people accept me for who I am 
and for what I do. Indeed. Um, so you've written a lot of the material that you've released over the years. You're you're a prolific songwriter as well as a prolific. Yeah, out of out of the full, out of the three hundred something records, I think I've written everything with about three or four songs. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of writing. <laughs> Now I don't know if people know this, uh, but but uh, certainly your your kind of first big hit was uh, Chicken Head, right? That was I mean, the first gold record. First gold record. First gold yes. record with Chicken Head, and it was hard for me to sell that record because I, the guy was with uh, VJ Records, told me about ten years before I re recorded the record, this was in six to eight, something like fifty seven, fifty eight. I had this song already written. Really, that early? Yeah, I had it written, but 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 it wasn't it wasn't Chicken Head. It was Chick Head. So Calvin, <laughs> so Calvin Carter came to me once and said, "What you got a record?" I said, "Yeah, I got a record called Chickhead." He said, "Oh, now his part business partner was a Jehovah's Witness preacher." Now you can you understand uh, preachers? So what you mean by Chickhead? Well, I was in the head of a rapper. You know, rapper talk that all the time. I said, "What you think I mean?" He said, "You don't mean Chick Chickhead, do you?" I said, "No, Chickenhead." He said, "Oh, yeah, yeah. You from down south? Tell me how the song go." I said, Daddy told me on the dying bed, give up your heart, but don't lose your head. You came alone, what did I do? Lost my heart and my head, too, because you had nothing to do with a chicken. It's true. That's <laughs> yeah, true. So, so I got it right over the head. I said, wow. This is where we got to have a B song, a B side. You know, at that time, you go to A and the B. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I got the B side. So where is it? I said, Mary Jane. He said, oh, yeah, I had a girl <laughs> did me wrong named Mary Jane. Then we going to do that. I wouldn't talk about a woman at all. I'll tell my, I'll tell my getting high with reefer. Oh, indeed. No, that's, that's. So I had two guys didn't know what the hell I was talking about. You know. Wow, man. Well, you know, I, I, I ain't gonna tell you which one, but I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I did have one of our door guys before you got here ask me, <laughs> ask me what Chicken Heads was about, and I yeah, said yeah. I don't know if I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell him, tell him, tell him. But yeah, you know, Buddy's been playing that song every night, actually. Uh, well, someone told me he played a lot because of, uh, if he played a lot, that's mean he think a lot about me and, and I think a lot about him. It's so, it's so nice that he would do that. And it's often nice that he would uh, invite me to his stage and be so kind to me that we're talking about some things that we hope, hopefully, that we can uh, be friends that we've been all the time. It even, even better than that, come together. Because we not only... Two old men. We both from Louisiana. That's true. You know, and uh, he's a little north of me, so he he's more a little alligator. I'm more a crocodile. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now I'm I'm also a little bit curious. Uh, so you came up to Chicago, and you were right there in the thick of everything. Yeah. You know, uh, recording with all those folks at Chess and, and playing all over town. Um, and then you said it was the weather that made your decision to, to go back to, uh, down south? Yeah, but two things. The weather was one, and I wanted to be independent. I wanted to go where I went. First, I went to Philadelphia, to Kenny Gamma and Leon Huff, who had Philadelphia records. They had the OJs and the Teddy Pendergrad and the whole bit. I went to learn from them, but they respected what I was doing so heavily. They were, I would walk in the studio. They would say, do what you want to do, Bobby Rush. All that was good, but I wanted to go there with them so I could pick their head, learn <laughs> what they was doing, because I liked what they was doing. Sure, sure. But they trusted my ability to write so well, and they looked what I was doing. They just kind of let me have my way. Well, when I found that out, I found out that I couldn't really learn anything uh, with that. Right. You know, because I, I could do that in Chicago or wherever. So then I would say, well, let me go... I, I, I knew about a guy who had a record company, Jackson, Mississippi, next door to Malico Records. So I said, here's a guy, probably don't know what to do with me. I could go to his label and put him up as a producer. He won't be producing it, but he won't know what I'm doing, don't care what I'm doing, just let me do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's what I did because... I wanted someone who would let me do what I wanted to do because I wanted to try this thing out. So I, re I record this record called Sue, you know? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it went like, there was a girl that I wrote about. Her name, was really her name was Emma Jean, Emma Jean Rainey. But I changed the name to Sue. It was a girl that I know was Sue. She was about 15 years old. And uh, 
and I was about 15, but at that time, when a girl 15, you 15, the girl knows, knew things a 25-year-old boy had never t mm. thought about. So my daddy told me one day, he said, he called me Junior, I'm a junior. He said, Junior, you got to leave Emma Jean alone because she don't mean you no good. I said, what you mean, daddy? She said, she'll do anything. And wow, what did he tell me that for? Because <laughs> I was looking for the girl to do anything, man. <laughs> yeah, so end up, so hey, you know, don't tell me to do anything. So yeah. then I wrote a song about this girl called Sue. And yeah. that was your second gold record, yeah? It was second gold record. So I'd say it went well going to the independent label. Yeah, thing, yeah, you know? yeah. I was going to ask you, actually, if you'd had any trouble once you'd you know, gone independent, but I guess not. No, like... <laughs> no, and I came back with this, this, uh, the third gold record for me and called Ain't Studying It. People were talking about, well, Bobby Rush, you ought to leave old Sue long because she mean you, this, that. But they were just saying that because they don't have her. Mm -hmm. So I said, Ain't Studying It. I wrote a song about that. Ain't Studying It. You know? Right on, man. And so those were those the three gold records that brought me around. And I had in it a lot of things. Uh, in between and before that did decent for me. A lot of records, a lot of ups and downs. But when you're independent, you go through them ups and downs. And I'm independent, so you go through them ups and downs. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you know, it seems like uh, the music industry has changed dramatically over that time period. And record labels in general have become a lot less important than they used to be. You know, it kind of used to be that they had a, a lot of things under lock, and now they're just one more player in the game. Well, the, the, record, the record company had on the lock, but we're still locked down now because even if you're independent, once you get your record cut, what, you, what are you going to do with it as you get it recorded? You, the record stores is, is gone. Yeah. Uh, the radio who's played the kind of music that we do, our buddy do, it's, it's gone. Yeah. They're not, they don't want to play the blues on the radio. That's true. Unless they're played by some of the white guys that play it, and it's, you know, they play at it. Then, 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 then the black guys who playing the blues, I blame some of them because they don't stick up with, with the blues or what they're doing and think it's all right to do because they invented a wah-wah. So the white guys could sound like the black guys. Now you got black guy buying the wah-wah trying to sound like a white guy who's trying to sound black. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So that's full circle? I'm not sure how that Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I'm so thankful to sit here and talk to you about the blues because right now I believe myself, Buddy Guy, and uh, is about the oldest one that's in this category right now. We have still have Jimmy Johnson still around, mm -hmm. uh, Eddie Clearwater, James Cotton still around. Now now see this is what we're talking about. See, all of us equally, just like you got five kids at your house. You love them all, but all of them don't have the equal part in the house to play. Mm -hmm. See, you can teach a man how to play a guitar, how to blow a harp or do whatever, but you can't teach a man to do some of the things that I do or ever Presley did. You got to be born to do that. That's the difference. Okay. That's the difference. Now... You know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people, so you guys are some of the last remaining of a certain generation of the blues. Um, and I guess some people, Buddy talks a lot about being worried about uh, what's going to happen to blues music. Yeah, I, I, I'm worried about that too. But, you know, I was in last night with Buddy Guy and we had some, some private talk and about different things about our life, what we've been, what we've done what we didn't do, what we should have done, what we could have did, should have, could have. Yeah. But overall, I don't know where this music is going, but it's going to go someplace. I don't know where it's going to go. Because it always been out of the, the black entertainer's control. Because when we did our music, and we did it well, it was stole from me. When we got the place we could control it a little bit, got the place now we can't display it. Because now you got your record, what you going to do with it? The guys walk around with a record on their arm, can't get radio play, and you can't get paid for it because they're downloading your, your, your sure. product. Right. So now you, you're still trapped. So what you going to do? You got to make sure that you're good at what you're doing and you got your stage present together because your bandstand is your record shop. If it don't work, you can't sell records. That's interesting. 
you can't set a record. So Buddy and I both is old men now. How long can we work? We got to work as long as we can because that's the only place we sell records is when you work. That's mm -hmm. your that's your band stand. That's your record shop. Sure. It's pretty much essential to be now out you there can, performing. Now we both got to run up and down the road day in and day out. Sure we both enjoy it. I'm quite sure he do too. I'm not speaking for him, but I'm yeah. quite sure he do. But then but how much enjoyment is when you work all the time and you haven't every job, if you make a little money, you ain't got time to spend it. You're too tired to spend it. Sure. But but that's part of life because you got no place to sell it. Sure. And I feel bad for the for the musician coming up and the entertainers coming up. And it's it's too bad, but see you got the entertainer and the musician in the same category. But there is a difference. Cow is a cow, horse is a horse. One give milk, one pull a wagon. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. That's the difference. Which one's the cow? In this, <laughs> the, 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 most of the time, the entertainer is the cow. Okay. Give, entertain, give milk. Okay. Because, you know, I respect the pine top and, and, and all the guys who play. Good musicians, but they ain't muddy waters. That's true. You got to face the fact. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go to church, all the members looking to go to heaven, but they have one pastor. Mm. Got nothing to do with your righteousness. One preacher. Right on, man. When you're on the stage, when I'm on the stage, maybe ten guys on the stage, but they have one Bobby Rush up there. That's true. <laughs> now, you are involved uh, as his buddy with this organization, PCA Blue. Yes. Um, and doing that to raise awareness about prostate cancer. Um, you guys are doing a show together I, in New Orleans. As I, I, I got into it accidentally, but I'm so glad it came to me that way. Someone called me about it, and I was glad to do it because it touched home with me several ways. Uh, not prostate all together, but I had one brother pass with prostate, two sisters passed with cancer, and one son. Wow. So that touches my heart from that. And I'm also touched by seeking cell anemia because I had a child pass from that. Mm -hmm. That don't mean that's the only thing that I'm involved with. Sure. That's one of the things that, right. that, that touched so much my home. And when I found out that Buddy was going to be involved with this and would like to be involved with it, I don't know what extent, but whatever the extent Buddy's involved, mm -hmm. whatever he do, I wouldn't do it because my man made up, and I just tell you, that whatever Buddy do from here out, whatever he do, if it's lined up with anything the right to do, I'll be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Because I think this is a good thing to do. Right on, man. Absolutely. Wow. It counts as such a, it's such a devastating thing, and it happens to so many people. Mm -hmm. And it's one of this is a helpless situation, and on and on and on. Y'all know that. So let me be a, let me lend my little name I have uh, to you and to the organization. Uh, we got several things we're talking about, some of them not completed yet at this mm -hmm. moment, but I know the Memphis thing is, and the New sure. Orleans thing is. Right, New Orleans is uh, June 12th. June 12th, yeah. and I'm gonna be there and to lend my hand as an entertainer. Hope we can draw people in, hopefully, that my little statements are my involvement, are my present, mm -hmm. would encourage people to come and be involved. Absolutely. It's a situation where uh, I don't think there's anything we can say or do other than bring some monies in, uh, educate people about it, how to take care of yourself, why you have it, and certainly how to cope with it while you're dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Not only the people who have it, it's the loved one that you have around you supporting you and taking care of you while you're sick. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need all of that. That's Absolutely. a burden. Well, thank you very much for being involved with that, man. So that's, that's PCA Blue again. If you want to check them out, you can go to PCABlue.org. And again, that show will be June 12th uh, in New Orleans. Now we've got to start to wrap things up here in a moment. And I want to remind everybody... Uh, porcupine meat is out and available right now. In, in, well, I mean, I know you've got to take them with you on the road, but they yep. can't find it uh, but in they stores, it, right? They, they can't find it in any place. But you go on the internet and find the record, play the record. If you're not satisfied with the record, call me. I'll get you a porcupine. 
Okay, there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. I do, I do anything but cook it. I don't know how to cook it for you. All right. Well, you know, that's all right. I've heard it's too fat to eat anyway. It's, so. but you, and you can't throw it away. So. Absolutely. Now, uh, before we go, uh, do you think you could share with us, uh, you know, one more story from, from uh, back in your time in Chicago, maybe when you were here with Muddy Waters or, you know, hanging out with Buddy doing one of these shows or recording over at Chess? I know you got a bunch of them, man. Oh, man, I remember going to something South Carolina myself. Willie Dixon, Elmo James, a few other blues guys. I'm a little guy dressing in a dressing room where there was one little light bulb. It was stuck up, it was on a, on a clamp. You stick it up there and you, you dress by this little light. So Willie said, well, Bobby Rush, you're going on second. I said, get ready. So I goes out to get ready to go in, I'm going to put a fancy dress on, I, I kind of dress a little different from a lot of the blues guys. I go and I put my clothes on, and the light went out. Somebody must have pulled it out the wall or something, you know? And them time, you know, you had the guys who want to go up first, who want to go up last, everybody want to be the star of the show. Sure. So I'm going up second. Somebody pulled a light out, so I went out on the stage. I was sharp, man. I had a black shoe on and a white shoe. <laughs> I went on the stage. Willie Dixon said, look at, look at old Bobby Rush, how cool he is. I looked down, and I just played it off. They thought I was the coolest cat in the world. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but actually, he was just getting dressed in the dark. <laughs> in the dark in a black shoe and a white shoe. It was, it was, it was, they thought I was just hip, you know, thought I was hip. All right, yeah. man. You know, I went to so Jimmy Reed. Jimmy Reed didn't want nobody to play his guitar. So Jimmy Reed was playing Ah, oh, baby, you don't have to go. Jim Marie said, Mama Ranch, talk out his nose. Go to the store and get me some whiskey. He would give me a dollar and a quarter to go get him some like, rock child whiskey. And after, I would, after he would drink a couple, couple shots or what have you, then he wouldn't know what he was drinking. So I would go four or five times. He'd give me a dollar and a quarter. I would fill it up half of it with water. <laughs> and so I would go to the store four or five times. That means I'm spending every other time. That's a dollar and a quarter for me, you know. <laughs> so I make about five dollars on uh, every day with Jimmy Reed because he was an alcoholic. All right, you know? and you're probably so, doing <laughs> probably doing him some good yeah, too, yeah, feeding him yeah, the water. Yeah, <laughs> and he was drinking it, watered down. He would say, "Mama Ranch, you sure buy some good whiskey." <laughs> <laughs> So those kind of those kind of stuff I oh, laugh about and talk about those kind of things. Well, so. thank you so much for joining thank us you. here today, ladies and gentlemen. Bobby Rush, thank his you. album Porcupine Meat is up for a Grammy. You can follow him on the internet. You can check him out in New Orleans on June 12th with Buddy Guy as part of the PCA Blue uh, Blues Tour to raise awareness about prostate cancer. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank here. you and thank you PCA for having me be a part of this. This is going to be great, great and greater. All right, ladies and gentlemen, one more time, Bobby Rush.